On today's show, Houston Rockets Summer League lessons. What do we learn about each of Reed Shepard, Cam Whitmore, AJ Griffin, Nafali Dante, and so much more? It's all coming up on today's Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. That's the best way that you can help our show out is to comment anything below the YouTube video. Just swing by and say Go Rockets helps us out a ton. Now today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Terms apply. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked On Rockets part of your day every single day. Whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym, thank you for being an everydayer. Joining us now is your weekly co-host, NBA draft enthusiast, and diehard Houston Rockets fan, Doctor Madison Amore. You can track down on Twitter at Madman Leaks. I tracked him down, guys. I brought him back after playing Miss Connections for what felt like the entire month, basically ever since the draft happened. It was like we yeah. had Madison like twice a week, every week in the lead up to the draft. We were doing all this draft content, and then the dude said, "All right, draft happened. Sayonara. I'm out. He's gone." <laughs> no, it's not me. <laughs> It was not. No, it was, look, life happens. It was yeah. it was really tough to connect, but we got you back on the program, man. Very happy to get you back in here. Right before you go on your European like tour yeah, yeah. of Greece and Paris and all that stuff. So we're gonna be missing you for the next couple weeks. Hopefully you have a fantastic trip. But We've got so much to talk about on today's show. We're going to get into what we learned from the Rockets prospects at Vegas Summer League. What, we, what do we learn about Reed Shepard, about Cam Whitmore, A.J. Griffin, Nafali Dante? I'm really excited to hear some of your thoughts on these guys, Madison. So let's start right here out of the gate with Reed Shepard. Just give me immediate general takeaway, and then we'll get into some specifics on him. Uh, new ceiling. That's that's my takeaway from Reed Shepard. Um, as you as you know, I, I love to evaluate the draft, and I think Reed Shepard... What I've seen for Reed Shepard has, to me, entered him into a different category of player. And that category of player is elite floor general. Um, and that is where I think his true value lied. I had a lot of apprehension about Reed um, in his elite skill just being the shooting, right? That, like, that, like he, I thought he did other things well. He did, he did other things very good. That He would be a good NBA player, right? But nothing else elite enough other than his shooting. And I, it had worried me, would we be able to generate enough volume with that shooting, uh, enough shot creation with that shooting to really be the impact player of an all-star level player, right? And what I what I personally learned from Reed is that he has the ability to be such a great decision maker, such a great passer and facilitator that he'll be able to leverage that to make other teammates better at a whole higher clip uh, honestly, an uh, engine in the in the in the way that Chris Paul is an engine, not the way that James Harden is an engine. I think those outcomes, Chris Paul is a you know a huge name, but those type of floor general uh, outcomes in the way that um, who's our Pacers guard? Uh, uh, Tyrese Halliburton. Tyrese Halliburton. In the way that Tyrese Halliburton is an engine for an electric offense. Offense. That is what I think his his new upside is. And he's such an efficient shooter. He'll be able to leverage his ability to make others better to get good shots. Right. And he's such an efficient shooter. He'll knock them down at a at a, an elite clip and he'll be able to problem solve on the fly. And I think that in and of itself gives him all star potential and just is a really clear path for him to be a very successful player in this league. I'm glad you're highlighting it because it really does stand out. The decision-making was absolutely huge. So yeah. much so to the point that in a way, I think, especially in those first couple summer games, mainly mm -hmm. that very first one, you could tell that he was almost more reserved about getting any shots up because he wanted so badly to make the right reads, to make the right decisions on the floor. And I do think that, you know, it, it's... You don't want to overreact or, or underreact to Summer League. You want to take it for what it is. But I do think that the decision-making that he had on display throughout the entirety of, of his four games at Summer League, that is something that is going to translate and is a very important skill for that, that point guard position on the floor, right? You're the quarterback. You're the floor general. You're in charge of getting everybody else set up, putting them in the right spots. 
And just even though Summer League is, you know, a bit more rec league at times, pick up mm-hmm. game style, whatever. It's just the little things that he noticed, right? Understanding, hey, I've got, you know, I, I'm running the break and I've got Cam Whitmore in the wings, right? And then he's running towards the bat. Let me just lob it up, right? Easy connections there, right? You're able to see that quick chemistry or you were able to see that quick chemistry on display with with Reed and Cam, largely because Reed is such an excellent decision maker when he's mm-hmm. handling the offense. Yeah, man, it was it was actually a marvel to watch, especially in those first two games. Um, and also, there, there's real passing talent there. Not just like that he makes the correct decision, but there is there's some talented passes in his film. Yo, bounce that passing would, through did, traffic? Bro, like, are you I kidding mean, me? misdirection, moving guys with his eyes. Right? We didn't. We saw flashes of that at Kentucky, but he just didn't have the usage for us to really understand what it would look like if he got that type of usage at the, at the next level. But now this guy's entered to me firmly into a, a different grade or tier player, a different archetype uh, more of player where the elite shooting is just one of the tools in a very big toolkit. And his just understanding of where to be on the floor, how to get to his spots, what he's looking for, how to problem solve, it, it, it just was very encouraging to see. And it, it wasn't all good. I actually have uh, some apprehensions about that stuff, too, because just as good as his decision making was, he had a nine turnover game, which is, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't you can't not talk about those things like the nine turnover game. I thought when teams got aggressive defensively, they sped him up. He kind of telegraphed some uh, some of those passes. And you could tell that teams could really wear him down at this point in his career. He could get worn down with all that usage. And over the course of a, a full game, you could see him start to make mistakes. But that, I think, can all be cleaned up. You know what I mean? Once he becomes a real professional, a real NBA uh, uh, player, you know what I mean? That is the growth is just being consistent with that floor general stuff. And uh, I think – we're going to have a real gem, the possible all-star superstar on our hands. It very much feels that way. And when you start, you know, taking kind of, uh, you know, taking stock of what other NBA pundits, talking heads are saying, the way that other people are talking about Reed Shepard, his skill set, his talent mm-hmm. level, you know, you kind of get that general consensus that like, holy crap, like we might look back a few years from now and be like, this guy should have been the number one overall pick far and away for this draft. And, and the Rockets may come away with, you know, thinking, oh my goodness, like jumping up to pick three completely changed the direction mm-hmm. of the franchise because that's how good this guy has a chance to be. Now, you know, we focused a lot here on the offensive side of things. Defensively, I did think he stood out in a variety of ways defensively. Mm-hmm. I think that he actually has that similar kind of skill set to Atari Eason, where he's kind of a, a defensive playmaker in a way with, you know, deflections, getting his hands on different passes, that kind of thing. But I and I, I've shared this sentiment a couple different times now. I do think there is something too, though. He's he's gonna have to there is, I won't say he's a defensive liability, but the lateral quickness there and yeah, the blow issue. buys were absolutely concerning. And I, and I don't know how much improvement there can be in that regard, how much of it is technique, how much of it is scheming as a team defense, right? Making sure guys are in spots to help him, you know, on the side, mm-hmm. funneling offensive players to a certain area of the floor, different things mm-hmm. like that. I am very interested to see how Udoka and the coaching staff address that side of the floor. Cause he's not, He's not a traffic cone defensively. No, yeah. He tries. He works hard, mm-hmm. and he he he's impactful in certain ways. He's also a little bit detrimental in other ways. Well, I mean, the biggest thing is he competes, right? You want yeah. a guy that's out there and who's competing, and he does have that one that one elite playmaking skill. But it's it's the type of skill that he has to over rely on because he's always getting beat. But I think that can be made up for with good team defense and really just being an elite offensive player. It, it, you could be so good on offense where it doesn't really matter, and he's not a complete zero because. The type of playmaker he is can be a momentum starter for your team, especially with how unselfish he is. But he has to understand when and where to, to choose his battles, right? So we've seen a game where he had, what, you know, seven fouls? Yeah, you, <laughs> you know, were he had a, a bunch of fouls so, because yeah, he was slapping with just, his hands constantly. That's because he's, he's constantly behind and, he, and he's trying to make up with that elite skill. And when he gets against, when he goes against real offensive savants, they're going to take advantage of that. They're stronger than him. They're, you know what I mean? And I, I think it's 
how he chooses. He has to choose when he's gonna uh when he's gonna use that elite skill, know when those opportunities come. But I think that's all within the realm of possibility for Reed as he develops over time. I, I likened it to LP a little bit because LP had had mm-hmm. that same learning curve, right? Where you can see it because these guys who yeah. they process the games a lot faster than other people, and that processing that you see on display offensively for these two guys as kind of passing phenoms with their playmaking ability, you also see it on display defensively where they're able to anticipate certain passes or certain moves before they even happen and then they use their quick hands to disrupt whatever play is happening but the same thing that we saw with Reed on display in summer league where he racked up all those fouls that one game we saw that all throughout Alpi's rookie season right he was a constant mm-hmm. foul magnet because he was constantly looking to make a play defensively using his anticipation his quick hands all that and he had to learn how to tone that down a little bit and mm-hmm. and so it those lessons will come with time right he's gonna have more than his fair yeah. share of like welcome to the NBA moments this season mm-hmm. but it's going to be exciting nonetheless now we, we we talked a lot here about reed shepherd we got some other guys we want to talk about though we want to talk a little bit about cam whitmore going to get to aj griffin navali dante and any additional thoughts that we have about these summer league performances and kind of what we learned about these guys we're going to get there in just one moment first today's episode is brought to you by game time Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer that it gets to first pitch. And look, they've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Because look, I don't know about you, my least favorite thing when I'm buying tickets could be to a baseball game, basketball game, concert, whatever, right? Is you're buying the tickets and then at the very end, right as you're getting ready to check out, they hit you with all these, they price gouge you with all these, you know, digital handling fees and service fees and service charges and all this stuff. And it sucks because you wind up paying more in charges than you do for like the actual tickets to go to the event that you want to go to. That doesn't happen with game time. They have their all in price. So you know exactly how much you're paying from the jump, from the jump, fully transparent the whole way through. So take the guesswork out of buying your tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on MBA for $20 off 20 bucks off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account, and redeem code locked on MBA. That's L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. All right, Madison. <sighs> Bit of a mixed bag for Cam Whitmore at Summer League. Uh, that's I, I, I don't know any other way to put it because I don't know how you have a couple games where you look like you're too good to be out there on the floor for Summer yeah. League. And then you roll out there and give us a, a what is it, one of 15 performance it was? Yeah, that was tough. That game three was something brutal. Uh, no, I mean, I, I actually love that game. I love that Detroit came out with like some real, real NBA defense, like real NBA uh, uh, game plan. Yeah, as, as, a, as, like, a, as a basketball yeah. fan, sure. As a yeah, Rockets yeah. fan, damn. But, I'm like, that but was... I, yeah, as a Rockets, but as a Rockets fan, that's what I want my young guys to figure out where they are. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is how we figure out where they are here, so that's why i mean i was a jackie your, about it it really everybody it ain't sweet like here you go like, here, here's your reality check like you thought you were too good for summer league two games then all right here we go let's let's see what it looks yeah. like so so but initially so this is my what i've taken away from cam cam still has a long way to go and mm-hmm. cam has a long way to go right now what's going good for cam is cam is this elite off ball play finisher He's just, he's an absolutely elite off ball play finisher, a guy who can catch a shoot, who knows when and where to cut. Uh, he uses that energy. He gets on the boards. He plays good on ball defense and he's, he's gotten a lot better off ball and his energy and activity and excitement can really ignite a team and it can put up a lot of points quickly. Now, what Cam needs to work, work on is Cam is not the same type of shot creator, the same level of shot creator that one would guess with his archetype of player, right? He, it, I think he struggles to create space if he doesn't bump you off the, off your spot with using his body. And he didn't really show any much advanced shot creation. I was hoping he would take a step in actually becoming a better shot creator, even though he did show that he want, he moved the ball well, but he's still, to me, there's a long way to go. But it's good that he's uh, taking coaching and he's taking those things into account and he's trying to make those plays. But for me... Cam still has a long way to go. I mean, Jalen is nowhere near the efficient player that Cam is, but Jalen can create space and get an open shot, right? And get, and get a make a makeable shot. If Cam isn't knocking you off your spot 
with his power and aggressiveness, he really doesn't have a way to get a, get generate consistent open shots. And I think that's what I kind of see where he is right now. Yeah, at this point, I mean, even uh, date, even dating all the way back to Jalen's rookie season, you put the ball in Jalen's hands, he can create either for mm-hmm. himself very, can very consistently or creating for others. And that's been one of the, you know, mm-hmm. kind of the saving graces of Jalen Green's career so far is he, he, he has grown considerably as a playmaker, mm-hmm. so much so to the point that, I mean, hell, at the end of last season, we had people drawing comps to like De'Aaron Fox and like maybe that's Jalen's future in the NBA mm-hmm. is, you know, as a lead guard primary creator instead of this, you know, dynamic two guard scoring option if he can't get, you know, to the place where his his scoring is that consistent, but if he can consistently leverage his scoring threat into plays for his teammates and and other players, then so be it like that. How do you get the best out of Jalen Green, right? Didn't see that, you know, much from Cam. Obviously, there were there were points where like that first the first two quarters of summer league against the Lakers, it was kind of rough, right? Like the ball was sticking a little bit, no passing happening, like, you know, kind of the the black hole offensively, right? Where the ball gets to Cam and it's not leaving his hands until he puts a shot up. Basically, I, I do like that the coaching staff kind of did what they did last year again with Tari Eason, Jabari Smith Jr. They tried to kind of put him out of his comfort zone a little bit, mm-hmm. let him run the offense a little, even though it looked pretty bad at times when he was mm-hmm. running the offense. I like that they experimented with it. Mm-hmm. I like that that was clearly you know, a point from, from Ime Udoka to coach Garrett Jackson was like, Hey, I want cam to walk the ball up occasionally. I want him to run some pick and roll. I want him to try and involve his teammates a little bit. And you're right. He's just, he's not at a place where he's comfortable doing it yet. Um, and it does kind of make you think, because I know one of the things that we talked about way back when, you know, before the Rockets even drafted cam was the idea that, you know, a guy with his skill set should theoretically be able to grow into a really elite playmaker because of the fact that he's going to draw so much defensive Mm -hmm. attention, right? The way that he's able to collapse the defense, the number of bodies that it's going to take to actually slow a guy like him down. Because when he's guarded in single coverage, I mean, it's, it's, pretty much game over like especially if he's if he gets the ball off the catch like on the wing oh my god that explosive first step takes two strides towards the rim and then he's elevating trying to put somebody on a poster it's fantastic you don't see that same level of like edge i guess when he's the one initiating the offense so that's why i I fully agree with your sentiment about him being an elite play finisher which is fine because he doesn't Mm -hmm. have to do more than that right now for his role to be really effective on this rockets team Yeah, man, I I think you hit it right on the head. That is exactly the point I was trying to make. But I I will say that Cam, I will say that I think Cam's game fit perfectly with Reed Shepard, this guy who knows when and where to be offensively so he can get him the ball, right? And Cam did flash some good passes. There was a there was a uh, pass in the Lakers game, I believe, where he he drove all the way down to the to uh, the basket and passed it out to a wide open three for Reed Shepard, one of his few and you know few wide open threes that he got over the course cuz nobody else could create a shot for him and you know i i really enjoyed that and if we could just get a little bit more out of that with cam but yeah man it's just up and down with him right now but that's okay cuz he's a, he's still a really young player and still going to be very effective in that role playing off of Ree Shepard, Amon Thompson and Alperen Shingun he's a perfect complement with that energy and if he can become you know a pseudo elite defender right he can get on the floor even more and really start to challenge for minute challenge for minutes now that we have even more playmakers in the off uh, in the offense and we know too that like he he's not he's not a slouch on that end at all when it comes to mm-hmm. d- defensively he's got the physical gifts to be a, a very uh, to be an incredible defensive piece for this rockets team i do wonder too one thing that i did kind of note and i don't know how much to take away from this because it's summer league, whatever, but they're like body language wise. There were definitely some play, especially, especially that third game against the Pistons. There was a lot of like, I really yeah. don't want to be out here right now. Kind of body language. And it, it's tough to like, you know, how much stock do you really pay attention to? How much do you put into that? It, it is summer league. It's probably game three. He probably thought he was going to be done after the first couple games. Don't know why necessarily they felt the need to play play him that third game. But I I, I kind of just brush it off and say, look, he's he's been nothing short of amazing so far in everything that the Rockets have asked of him. He's constantly putting in work. We know that behind the scenes, I mean, we only see, I want you guys to know, we only see a fraction of like the clips and the workout videos and stuff when he's working out with Aaron Miller and everything. I want y'all to know, like Cam is constantly in the gym with Aaron Miller. Like they are constantly getting work in. And that's one of the most encouraging things is just knowing that he is so about his craft and trying to get better every single day, you know, last off season, this off season, year round, basically. Yeah, man, I, 
I believe in Cam. Cam's going to be a great player in this league. I mean, I, I really believe in his power and athleticism. And we know he's putting in the work. Fun, it's fun, just going to take go him a little bit. Buzzword, of time. Functional athleticism. There we go. Our buzzword. <laughs> yeah. Got to revisit that. <laughs> functional one. athleticism. Yes, sir. But yeah, man, we we know Cam will be ready. He just still a, a, a little bit more creation. Got to get more comfortable with having the ball in his hands and actually directing the offense and actually, you know, making more space than himself other than just, you know, driving through people's chest. What? What does your gut tell you right now? Do you ever think Cam is going to be a full-time offensive initiator, or do you think he's just going to be a really great dynamic second option? Yeah, I think it's I think it's well within the outcomes for him. Like mm -hmm. I, I really do. I really think I think it's going to be interesting to see how he develops on this type of team because we have these other guys and they're all kind of vying for those type those types of positions. But he may not need to if he's playing with such great. Uh, creators he may just be this this elite off ball finisher where he finishes everything and he does have a little bit of creation in his game but i definitely think the step back will will, will always be there for him he just has to get that handle to a spot where he's comfortable changing pace and being patient right he's usually just on the right, go when right now going. it's all one speed it's, it's yeah, all yeah. gas no brakes i'm gonna it's drop all, my shoulder into you yeah. and i'm either drawing a foul exactly. or, I'm, or i'm putting you on a poster or what or i'm finishing at the cup as you're falling into the stanchion but that's exactly. it like that's yeah, yeah. so it, him I, I think that's probably the next biggest event like think think about this past season right for jalen when he started to finally understand tempo and using mm -hmm. utilizing the hang dribble and and opening himself up by by speeding up and decelerating appropriately you know to really throw defenders off a little bit that was something that Jalen probably should have had in his game sooner yeah. because he doesn't have the the raw physical strength that Cam does to just rely to just flat out bully guys away but the moment that cam starts to understand that a little bit more and he understands okay if i go if i go 80 then go 100 and then pull it yeah. back to 70 pop the clutch a little whatever i gotta do yeah. then it's it's game over and i'll have and, a lot of wide open shots and, and and like even simple things like this cam gets the ball initiates the offense he goes he drives he gets cut off and then reverses it mm -hmm. and and goes back and gets the ball. You know, you, you, we watch these plays with with, with Reed uh, this summer league with Jalen, where the first option is is broken up and they have to give it back to uh, Shingun and just reverse and rerun the offense. Right? Oh, this our first option was up. Let's reverse. Let's try this again. Like that type of poise within his game. We just we have yet to get to that point with Cam. And if he could just understand some of those nuances, like everything doesn't have to be make the play right now or shoot the ball right now i think he'll he'll be better served for it coming up we've got our final segment where we will share some thoughts and takeaways on aj griffin nafali dante and anything else that comes to mind about what we learned from this houston rockets summer league squad we're going to get there in just one moment And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. A uh, bit of a programming note as I am looking on my screen. Uh, it's actually not Fafali Dante that we will be talking about in this segment. It is Nafali Dante. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to edit that in post. Uh, it's just going to stay as Fafali Dante on the little sidebar. Uh, took me three segments to realize that. But anyways, uh, let's start. We'll start with actually AJ Griffin here because, man, Madison, like I... Like I tried when I when when the AJ Griffin trade first happened, I'll admit, like, first off, great trade. Absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic trade. Yes. And I think it, it was great value. It's a great, you know, low risk, high reward kind of play. And and I want to preface what I'm gonna say by saying I am not out whatsoever on AJ Griffin. But his summer league performance did not inspire much, if any, confidence whatsoever. I, I, again, I, I think there were there were some Rockets fans out there like claiming that the Rockets had like a, a young core eight with the addition of AJ Griffin, wow. like I, the moment I saw stuff like that, I was rolling my eyes mm -hmm. until I could see the back of my skull because <laughs> there's a reason that he completely fell out of the rotation in Atlanta, right? It wasn't just the off the court stuff. It was literally just his basketball production was not on par with the expectations for a high level coach in Quinn Snyder. Mm -hmm. So th that kind of matched the eye test a little bit in summer league for me is, you know, yeah. I, 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 I think there were times where he was trying to do a little bit too much, trying to showcase a little more skill than he probably has, you know, putting the ball on the floor, doing a little bit too much with it when all I really needed to see was, hey, can you knock down some open shots and can you play solid defense? And right. the shot was super inconsistent yeah. and the defense was almost non-existent. So... Yeah, it wasn't... There, there wasn't much good to take away from A.J. Griffin. I mean, like you said, um, I think 
these summer league can be a glorified uh, uh, pickup game, right? Yeah. And we got we get a lot of these guys who are like trying to make a name for themselves, trying to make the team, and then they just disrupt the flow of the offense, and then they turn the teams like offensive sets into these one on one isolations, and they throw up a terrible shot. And I'm sad to say. That was my biggest problem with it. I'm so sorry. Yeah, like literally as you were saying that, I was getting like PTSD flashbacks because yeah. there was a, a couple of the games I was sitting like, uh, like baseline courtside for a couple of the games where the Rockets were playing offense on that baseline, right? Like on that side of the floor. And there was one possession. I can't remember which team it was against, but there was one possession where AJ Griffin had the ball on the on the right wing because I was sitting like left baseline. He had the ball on the right wing, drove it in, got to kind of like the 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 low block picked up his dribble and I'm telling you, he did about like six or seven, like pirouettes on his pivot foot. Reed looked off Reed Shepard, who was wide open in the corner, like multiple times cut, you know, ran baseline, got to the corner, like not quite like a floppy action, but he was there. He was open, looked him off. And then in in turn, like turned around and shot up like this, some BS, like, you know, 10 footer, like falling out of bounds behind the backboard. And I was just like, Oh, like, what are we doing here, man? And I don't, I don't think players understand how much that really hurts them in the eyes of coaches. Mm. Like that, that is, that is, that is not smart basketball. Right. And, and teams want you to be able to assimilate to our offense, be able to show that you can run and flow and fit in within the offense. And I think AJ was in prove it mode and he needed to, and all that was asked of him was to be a part of, be a cog in this offense and convert with your opportunities that uh, m- more importantly, uh, like you said, the, the defense was not very good. Um, it's on ball defense. He really struggled. I thought he was slow footed as per his, his scouting report and how he looked at Duke, but also offensively, what really was upsetting is there wasn't much off ball cutting, right? Like, like, if you like compare, when you contrast it, when you compare and contrast to Cam Whitmore, Cam who's Whitmore, constantly yes. moving off ball, exactly, exactly, and and that's what and that's what I'm talking about. Like understanding that, hey, you have a point guard who's running the show. Um, it, he's he's looking to get it, guys involved. You can do more than just stand in the corner, right, on those possessions. And when it and when it reverses to you, you can trust that if the shot isn't there, you can reverse it back to him, and he'll get a better shot for you. You know what I mean? And I, there was just a lack of understanding with A.J. Griffin with that process. And he really, to me, gunked up the Rockets offense a lot of times when he got the ball. It wasn't just him, but it was it was disappointing to see from a player that's going to be on this roster or is going to have a chance to make this team. Like, you should understand how, how basketball works. And those are, those are the type of things that coaches hate. And when coaches hate stuff like that, you don't play. And now I'm starting to see some of why the Quinn Snyder decisions probably were, were made last year. Hey, look it, it, again, and th- this is where this is where it pays so many dividends to have a coach like Ime Odoka because if there's anybody that, that has a chance to like iron this kid out and get yeah. him to a place where he can at least play like you know acceptable NBA defense because w- the one thing that I've been told from all my like you know Atlanta you know colleagues cohorts whatever just that the, the shooting is real and it, it yeah. wasn't it wasn't great in summer league he had a, he had a couple games where the shooting looked nicer but mm-hmm. you know the, if the shooting is real for AJ Griffin if he is like this you know 40% roughly three point shooter there's always going to be a place for you in the NBA if you can have that consistent outside three point shot even if you're a defensive liability but ideally for him to really carve out a spot on this Rockets roster, I think he's going to have to be at least acceptable levels of defense. Like he just can't be a negative, like just get to mm-hmm. a place where you're neutral yeah. on defense, not a liability and then be a 40% three point shooter. He'll have a home here and he'll have yeah, a spot yeah. where he's, you know, he gets, you know, five, 10 minutes a night spot minutes here and there, certain matchups. You really need shooting. Cool. Throw AJ out mm-hmm. there, you know, maybe get some DNPs here and there, but whatever. So I'm not out on him, but I think he does j- very similar to what we said with camp. He's got a very, he's got a long way to go before he's, anything close to like a consistent rotation piece for this rocket team. But I still like the deal. I still like that they got him. And I like mm-hmm. that they, that they can afford to have him like waiting in the wings. as like a project, right? Because if he yeah. does work out, then Holy crap. Like you have a young, like wing trio of AJ Griffin, Tari East and Jabari Smith jr. For years to come. That's yeah. really exciting stuff. Mm-hmm. Last guy that we're going to talk a little bit about here. Uh, Nafali Dante. Uh, look, I, 
you you look i was excited when they signed him to the two-way and then i went and saw some of his film from oregon i was like okay like this guy's got like some potential yeah, here he's, he's, yeah. and then i don't know if it's because he was just completely outshined by orlando robinson yeah, who is yeah. clearly an nba level talent like maybe that has some some of it to, but even if orlando robinson wasn't on the rockets roster this summer league i think i still would have been pretty disappointed yeah. with with nefali dante he just I don't know. It didn't, it, nothing he did really spoke to me in, yeah. in a way where I was thinking like, maybe there's something like I was thinking like, okay, is the rebounding going to be really good or is his defensive presence going to be really good? Are they going to funnel guys into him? Can he, can he switch effectively on the perimeter? Like nothing really stood out about his game to where I thought, yeah, I'm glad we got this guy on a two way. Yeah, man. I, Nafali really strike me as a guy who just kind of isn't ready yet. Right. He just, he just, he, doesn't do the things good enough. The game seemed a little bit too fast for him. He he was often outrun down the court, you know, sometimes not understanding that he needs to get back in certain areas. Um, and but I did think he flashed a couple highlights. I thought I thought he got a, some couple chase down blocks that were very impressive. I thought his size was on display. I thought he did get some good offensive rebounds here and there, but nothing consistent. And when you and when you're getting so outplayed by Orlando Robinson, I think it kind of amplified how he looked and kind of made him look bad. But you know, not everybody is ready. Not not everybody is ready immediately. I think the game is a bit too fast for him, but doesn't mean he can't get there. And I, I you know, I don't think. I don't think he should be out on that two-way contract, but I definitely think he needs to put a little bit more work in, but I don't think it's as bad as we think it is. I wonder too, if again, some of it is just, he, he does provide an archetype that doesn't exist on this Rockets mm. roster. Again, he, he's the kind of your prototypical, like rim running big, mm. uh, you know, athletic lob threat. Where's my, there it is. Lob threat. There we go. Um, you know, he got a couple of those too, in addition to the blocks that he had on the defensive end. So maybe that's, that's more so what it was is the Rockets knew, Hey, you know, we've got this array of centers and, and obviously Al P is one type of center. Steven Adams is another type of center. Mm. We'll just go for Nefali Dante on a two way deal because, you know, this is this is what we can get access to to give us another kind of project player. Maybe he pans out. Maybe he doesn't. Obviously, the mm -hmm. Rockets aren't banking on him for any level of production this next season. So, I, you know, willing to see where it goes with him. But I'm also not holding my breath for him to suddenly become an NBA player overnight. Yeah, just didn't really pop in any real ways. Just just another guy right now. But I, w I will say, man, he, he's still a rook, man. So you got to give those guys a little a little opportunity to catch up to the speed hang, of the game. Hang on, hang even on, hang on. this summer league. J hang on. Better summer league performer for the Houston Rockets, Nafali Dante or Jay Huff? Jay Huff? Jay Huff by a hair? Like, are you like, <laughs> I mean, this is the Huff, Huff mid off of a century. He, he's, <laughs> he spaced the floor a little bit and then he, he earned that contract uh, with the Denver Nuggets. He had to sit that final summer league game. Rockets couldn't oh play him. <laughs> Cause he, that's, that's a deep cut right there. Yeah, man. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, look, on that note, we want to share, share some of your summer league takeaways from the crew from Reed Shepard, Cam Whitmore, AJ Griffin, Nafali Dante, anybody else that we didn't get to in today's episode. We want to just kind of focus on those four names, but give us any of your summer league lessons, what you learned about these guys. Let us know in those YouTube comments. Madison, you know the drill. Let everybody know where to track you down at, man. Find me at, at Madman Leaks on Twitter. Love Talk Rockets basketball, NBA draft. That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe. Leave us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. <laughs>